That's fine. Again. We're going to watch our second class of waves. These are, these, are the, these are waves in the tropics. These are the nautical waves in the tropics. And uh, Shane will tell us about these, and Shane's from um, UNSW. Okay, thanks, Michael. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I'm talking about equatorially trapped waves. I should just give a back, bit of a background about myself. So I'm at the Uni, Uni of New South Wales in the Climate Change Research Centre and I'm Associate Investigator with the Centre of Excellence. My main research area is in the tropical Pacific. I'm interested in El Nino, um, basically the temporal evolution of the events. So they seem to be synchronised to the seasonal cycle. So the events are kind of basically starting about now. They kind of peak around Christmas time and then they kind of decay early and, um, quite rapidly early next year. And we, we know that this happens, and I think it's still not really understood why this happens, so that's kind of the main area of my research. Um, I've also looked at, I suppose, regional patterns of sea level rise and, and so in terms of paleo, um, in, the, in its paleo context, to try and understand how it has varied in the past. Okay, so just give a brief outline um, of what we're going to go through in the talk. So we're going to start with just a description of a linear shallow water model basically following on from, um, so I think Paul's talk yesterday and Matt's talk yesterday both kind of got down to the, this kind of simple form of the um, equations of motion. Then we're going to talk about equatorial Kelvin waves and then move on to other kinds of equatorially trapped waves. So these are mixed Rossby gravity waves, inertia gravity waves and then Rossby waves. And then we're going to move on to about rate wave reflections at the boundary. So this is, I'm mainly talking about ocean waves, so these waves in the ocean and what happens when they actually reach the western and eastern continental boundaries. and then tying it all together, how this relates to ENSO. Okay, so first I'm just going to look, so this is just a, uh, a plot of um, five day temperature, a non, so five day temperature on the equator, it's an average between two north and two south. And there's two, I suppose three main things you really need to uh, observe from this. You can see there's the warm upper oceans, basically these kind of deep reds, and you can see it pretty much spreads over the entire entirety of the upper ocean. And then you've got this kind of cool lower layer down here, and you can see there's a really kind of sharp gradient between them. I think I might use the pointer. Okay, so you can see this is the, um, sorry, the 24 degree isotherm, and this is the 16 degree isotherm. And you can see how kind of close together these, uh, these isopycnals are um, across the width of the basin. So it basically says, but in the, in the ocean, we've basically got this warm, less dense upper ocean overlaying this cold, dense lower layer. And you can basically, should be able to represent as just to si represent this as a single uh, impenetrable surface. So this is basically what you consider, this is when you're considering a linear shallow water model, if you say you're talking about a first baroclinic mode shallow water model. So this is a, just a vertical um, temperature profile or density profile at some given point. So it's in the Indian Ocean, about 18 south, but you pretty much can do this anywhere um, in the equatorial oceans and you'll find, so the first n equals zero mode is just basically the mean, so it's saying that density does not change with depth. And then this first mode is the n equals one mode here, that's that red line and it basically says exactly that. It says we've got this kind of warm, less dense upper ocean overlaying a cold, um, dense lower ocean. Okay, so it's this red line and then you can kind of, basically you can kind of break down the vertical, den vertical density profile into the sum of all of these different modes. And it's like in any EOF decomposition, it's the first mode is always going to explain the most variance, and then as you're moving into higher order modes, you're going to explain less and less variability of this vertical densi density profile. So we're taking the assumption, we're going to look at the first baroclinic mode, so just saying the upper ocean is basically, yeah, separate, can be physically separated from the lower ocean. Okay, so this is what the, the model looks like. Um, these are very similar to the equations that Matt um, and Paul both, both presented yesterday. The main difference is we have a rigid lid approximation, so there's no changes in sea surface height like what they were modeling yesterday. We're modeling an internal surface, okay? The internal surface is eta, or the th basically represents the thermocline depth, and you can see the density um, above this is given by row one, and the density below is row two. So it's just saying there's a density difference between the two layers. Um, it oscillates around this kind of mean depth of H. I think the only real assumption going into this, apart from, yeah, there's a lot of them, but I suppose the main one, is that um, perturbations of the thermocline depth are small in comparison to this capital H. Okay, the other difference, main difference is we have this G prime term in the equation here when you're talking about pressure gradients. And that 
basically um, represents the fact that gravity is not operating on the surface of the ocean, it's how gravity is interacting with this interface between the two layers. So this is called the reduced, gar reduced gravity approximation. So it's basically how gravity um, inter like applies to the surface between these two density layers. And it's got you know, reasonably small kind of density differences, like we said, um, I think yesterday they were saying the ocean has densities between 1,026 and 1,028. <coughs> Um, density level, so it's kind of quite small. Um, and it gives us a gravity wave speed of the square root of G prime um, capital H. Okay, which for equatorial Pacific and realistic values of H can vary between anywhere from 150 to 300 meters. It's kind of an arbitrary choice, but it kind of depends on basically the polewood extent where you want your model to finish. If you're having the model extending further into the extra tropics, you're going to choose a, a larger capital H, is basically how I view it. So. Generally, gravity wave speeds for the paraclinic mode are around two to three meters per second um, in the ocean. Okay. All right. <coughs> Sorry. So we're taking the um, equatorial beta plane approximation. It's the same one that's been taken in all the previous work, but you're, the only thing you'll notice differently is um, previously it was f is equal to f naught plus beta y, but in this case f naught is, is the equator, so f naught's equal to zero. So we've just got f is equal to beta y. Um, we've got that Coriolis parameter plotted here as the black line, and the red dashed line um, is the approximation of beta y, okay, so the equatorial beta plane. And you can see it does a really good job between plus and minus 30 degrees. So in those kind of tropical latitudes, outside of this, it kind of starts to get non-realistic. And the main reason we're kind of using this is just to simplify it and make it easier to solve for these, uh, yeah, the equations or the waves we're looking for. Okay. I think I have to slow down, sorry. Okay, so we're going back to the linear shallow water model equations. Basically, Lord Kelvin kind of came up with this idea about coastally trapped waves. He wasn't really thinking about the equator when he came up with the idea, but he basically said, so if you've got any disturbance on the equator, the one thing you know, oh, sorry, on, on a boundary, the one thing you know about it is there's gonna be no flow normal to that boundary. So you can't have flow into or away from the boundary. He then extended this theory and said, if you can't, like, if you can't have flow normal to the, that boundary at the boundary, then there must be no flow normal to that boundary anywhere in the basin. Okay, and he then proceeded with this assumption. We can say that the equator basically acts as a boundary and we'll talk about why that is a little bit later on. But if you make that assumption, you can then set V is equal to naught, which makes the shallow water model equations reduced to this, okay? So these simplify equations, you can easily get a solution for U and th um, eta, thermocline depth. Um, and the middle term, so the, this is the, uh, the pretty much was the V velocity where we've set V to zero. You can say it's basically suggesting that the flow along the boundary is in geostrophic balance with the pressure gradient perpendicular to that boundary. So if you've got a perturbation on the equator, the pressure gradient's trying to flatten that out, whereas the um, Coriolis force is trying to, like totally balancing that, so there's no meridional flow away from the boundary. Okay, so this is the, the wave component of the solution and this is the, the decay of the solution. Basically, G can be any differentiable function. Um, you can consider it just an oscillating signal, so you could make it a sine curve or a cos curve. And the only thing it is, it's a function of um, the, you know, ex zonal direction. And this is C is the gravity wave speed and T, T is the time since the um, perturbation was started. So you can say the wave pro basically propagates at a speed of C, which is two to three meters per second. Um, if you're talking about the Pacific Ocean, a Kelvin wave crossing the Pacific Ocean, it's roughly 150 degrees in longitude. Okay, at pro propagating at two and a half meters per second, it'll take approximately 70 days, 60 to 70 days, so around two months to cross that basin. Okay, this, this all, um, this kind of time frame is relatively slow. It's re well, it's relatively fast for ocean time scales, but slow enough that it gives you some kind of predictability about what you're going to see and what the response is, which is quite interesting when we start talking about um, El Nino uh, a little bit later on in the talk. Okay. So now moving on to just this right-hand component, the exponential decay. It basically just says the um, any perturbation on the equator is going to decay exponentially away from the equator with um, this, fold, with this uh, e folding time scale, which is basically the Rosby, equatorial Rosby radius of deformation. 
basically the Rossby radius of deformation is given by this, which is C over y, uh, C, C over F, and F it's F at the latitude you're interested in. So you can choose. If you substitute in here the beta plane approximation, so f is equal to beta y, you can then choose a beta y, um, sorry, you can then choose y which is equal to um, r, r and r at the equator. Okay, so they're all the same and then you can swap this y for the r here and then you have an r squared is equal to c over beta. Okay, which gives you this, this is the deformation radius. Okay, and it's basically the, the decay, meridional discate decay scale of the waves, and which is one of the main things that's suggesting that they're equatorially trapped. Um, why they're equatorially trapped, I think, becomes a little bit clearer in the next slide as well. Okay, so this is, you can get this anyway from the solutions that I've plotted on the previous page, but just thinking about this, we have, um, so this is a, like basically a sea surface height perturbation um, on the equator, so you've got the southern hemisphere in the, on the left, okay, so a flow out of the page means flow going from east to west, and a flow into the page means a, pa a flow going from, wait, <laughs> this is going from west to east, and this is going from east to west. Okay, so along with that sea surface perturbation, you've got the pressure gradient force trying to flatten out that perturbation. Okay, and if you consider which way the Coriolis force is gonna go, so flow out of the page, so you, Coriolis acts to the left in the southern hemisphere and to the right in the northern hemisphere. So flow out of the page means you're gonna have a Coriolis force that balance the pressure gradient force consistent with what you expect from the, the V equation. Um, where you have flow into the page, you're gonna get both the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient force are going the same direction, so the bump's just gonna flatten out, okay? If you consider the reverse of this, so if you consider a sea surface height depression um, or, or a trough, you basically got a reverse pressure gradient force, which to get this balance, you also need a reversed flow. So if you're talking about a, an upwelling Kelvin wave, in terms of a thermocline depth, an upwelling Kelvin wave causes a depression in sea surface height. So an upwelling Kelvin wave will be associated with flow that goes into the page, or it's a a depressed sea surface height. It's kind of very confusing. So I'll, I'll try and stick with sea surface height from here on in when I'm talking about it. But um, yeah. Okay. So this is just a schematic representation trying to understand how the waves kind of propagate, how they propagate in time. So we've got um, longitude. On the x-axis, we've got the amplitude of the sea surface height perturbation or the U current anomalies, whichever one, uh, they're both interchangeable, so it makes no difference. And the black line represents our initial kind of perturbation. And the solid arrows are the flow that go along with that perturbation. So we can say when we've got a sea surface height crest, you've got flow that goes from uh, west to east. And when you've got a sea surface height trough, you've got flow that goes from east to west, so you've got inverse flow. Now, if you're calculating the, you know, the derivative, the x derivative of this um, zonal flow, you find you end up getting convergence at the eastward edge, okay, at the eastward edge of this signal and divergence at the trailing edge or the westward edge of this signal. It causes the, um, basically the wave to propagate in time. So it's much like the Rothby waves that, we were just, that Laura was just talking about, but obviously the opposite direction. So it's this convergence and divergence um, of the flow that causes the waves to propagate. Okay. All right. So now what we've got plotted here is the dispersion relation. So it's just showing um, basically how, sorry, how the um, phase speed or the, sp weight, the speed of the crest is related to the dispersion of energy with the relation. So a feature of the Kelvin wave is it's non-dispersive, non so that means the wave crests and the energy of the waves propagate in the same direction. So and looking at this, you can see, so you've got the, the wave speed basically here given by this. You can see the Kelvin wave is a one-to-one -one line, so it doesn't matter what frequency the wave is that you're generating, it's gonna have a one-to-one, -one, so the speed's are always gonna be exactly the same. So it's the same speed regardless of the frequency. And in terms of the energy, the group energy, we're talking about basically the derivative or the slope of this line. And the slope of this line is constant, okay? And it's constant, so it's got a one-to-one -one line, so it's always that same. So the energy is propagating the same direction with the same speed um, as the wave crest. So it's non-dispersive, so it's a non-dispersive wave. So dispersion basically occurs when you have um, 
when you've got a bunch of waves of different frequencies and each of the waves at different frequencies propagates away from the disturbance with different speeds. So then when you're looking at the energy of these things, the energy can be seen to propagate at slower speeds or faster speeds or even, even backwards compared to the actual propagation of the crest. So it's, yeah, I don't know. This, this is one of those things that you read a lot and every now and then you see a movie and you kind of totally understand it and then after a, you know, a month or two of not looking at it, I'll come back to this point and I'll be totally lost again what it actually means. So it's kind of, I have fleeting mo moments of clarity. <laughs> okay. So going through what we know so far about an equatorial Kelvin wave. Okay, so they have no flow normal to the boundary, so normal to the equator, so there's no meridional velocity. They have a maximum amplitude on the equator that decays away from the equator um, that follows the radius of deformation. The flow along the boundary is in geostrophic balance with the pressure gradient force. Um, and they propagate from east to west, okay? This is also consistent. I mentioned at the beginning about these coastally trapped waves. When you're talking about a coastally trapped wave, the boundary is always on the left in the southern hemisphere and the boundary is always on the right in the northern hemisphere. So what this means is waves that are propagating on, like Kelvin waves that are propagating on a western boundary. So if you're talking up the coast of Australia or down the coast of China, they're gonna to propagate towards the equator. Whereas on the eastern side of the basin, Kelvin waves are gonna propagate polewards. Okay, so the southern hemisphere, the boundary is always gonna be on the left. Okay. Um, so what they do, they have a speed of roughly two to three meters per second and they allow the west Pacific to communicate with the east Pacific or the west, hand, west side of any basin to communicate with the east side of the basin relatively fast. And for the Pacific, we're talking kind of roughly two months or 70 days. Um, upwelling Kelvin waves have uh, eastward velocities are associated with while downwelling have the opposite. Okay, so this is just a movie. It's, I wouldn't really call it eye candy because it's a very simple solution and it goes through very fast, but I'm trying to uh, mix it up for you. Okay, so it's basically what I've got is just a patch of wind stress on the equator. Um, it's a fixed magnitude between plus and minus five degrees and then it decays linearly to plus and minus 10 degrees and the patch is between 150 and 200 degrees east. It's just applied for 10 days and then we just watch um, this, the linear shallow water model um, yeah, evolve after that for 120 days, so four months. <laughs> so basically, this is your equatorial Kelvin wave. You can see it's kind of propagating east, eastward. Um, you can't really see it because I didn't figure out how to do it, but this is the American coast here. This is kind of New Guinea, Australia's down here. And, and when the signals kind of keep propagating, you'll see the, the outline of the continents. And this is a Rosby wave pair that are straddling the equator and these signals are propagating to the west. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about those later on. So you can also see, basically, whoops, where were we? We'll get back to that. So this is all happening in the space of kind of four months. So this is, oh man, what's going on? Sorry. <laughs> Okay, if we stop it here, so this is the most, one of the most interesting things we're all going to, also going to talk about. You can see this Kelvin wave, when it reached the boundary, it initiated coastal Kelvin waves, which propagated um, towards the poles, like we explained, and also we had these, Ros these Rosby waves here. They also trigged off um, a Kelvin wave that propagated around the coast of New Guinea and kind of down the west coast of Australia, you can see it down here. So this causes variations in the Lewin current. That's quite often reported um, as a consequence of an El Nino event. Okay, moving on to Kelvin wave in, in the observation. So this is a really recent plot. So this is of this year. So I think it's, the labels are really hard. So this is kind of January of this year. This is February. This is around March of this year. And this is April. Sorry about the, the labeling. And what we've got here is bursts of westerly wind on the equator. So this is winds blowing from west to east um, on the equator. And there's, you can see these three kind of main bursts that have happened and you can see it around the same time in the ocean. So this is upper ocean heat content, which is a proxy for thermocline depth. Um, basically, and you can see at the time these wind bursts happen, you can see these kind of signals that were kind of propagating away from the equator. So as time is increasing here, and this is longitude, so these are propagating eastward consistent with what you expect from a Kelvin wave. The main thing, or the, the main thing I can, I suppose should point out is the propagation time for this one is roughly 90 days. 
to get from 150 to 80 west, which is kind of consistent with wave speeds of about two meters per second. It's a bit slower than what we're expecting, or it's at the lower end of what we're expecting, whereas these ones are kind of faster, um, and these are very consistent. So these are about two and a half to 2.8 meters per second, these two waves. And I think one of the main things that kind of comes into this is you can kind of see this has wind, wind signals kind of um, going across the basin at similar time, similar times. So I think the fact that these winds are kind of there also overlaying, and it's not just a single burst propagating a wave away from it. You've kind of got this overlying winds also kind of complicating the picture. And I suppose another thing we need to consider is the shallow water model and all the theories. We're, we're just using a, a set fixed density gradient between the upper and the lower ocean, and we're saying it doesn't vary in space and it doesn't vary in time. And that's a very simplistic view and it, we know it varies in space and we know it varies in time. So all of those kind of things can have an impact on the rate at which these waves propagate. But I think it's kind of pretty phenomenal to consider you know, that some guy was just sitting around you know, 150 years ago, solved these equations, and then here they are you know, in, in the ocean. So with no real kind of observational um, data to come along with it. Okay, this is just another panel um, showing, again, from the observations from this year. Um, so this is longitude again, and this is depth sections, okay? And so what we're seeing is temperature anomalies with depth. And we said the thermocline was basically that region where you had the 16 degree isotherm and the 24 degree isotherm, the isotherms that were kind of really closely together. So we were talking, um, the perturbation magnitudes we're talking about uh, changes in the 20 degree isotherm depth of about 20 meters. And it's amazing that kind of this is equivalent to changes in temperature that are roughly four degrees in the subsurface. So just this kind of relatively small vertical change has such a dramatic impact on the temperature anomalies because the gradient is so sharp in that region. Uh -huh. So this is a problem. It's basically an application of kind of what we've talked about so far, so what you know about equatorial Kelvin waves, what we know. So we're going to consider an irregular grid problem. So basically, um, there's a, a couple of the models that are in CMIP5. Um, this is the, it's more apparent in coarse resolution models. So the Max Planck model, Max Planck Earth System model uses a curvilinear grid. Okay, basically what they do, they get hold the South Pole fixed and they get the North Pole, which is, um, has a singularity over the ocean, and they pull the North Pole and stretch it. Okay, so the North Pole sits over Greenland. What it ends up doing, it stretches all of the grid cells um, on the, over the Pacific and India, uh, Indonesian region, okay, and it compresses them over the Atlantic region. Can anyone think, um, in terms of a Kelvin wave, what kind of implications this might have? What's the, I suppose, the one criteria that we know for a Kelvin wave that we needed to do to get the solution? Maybe this will help. Okay. So this is a plot um, of 20 degree isotherm depth correlated with um, sea surface temperature in the Nino 3 region. So basically this is a, a Rossby wave pair and a Kelvin wave signal. Can you see the, the alignment of the grid cells here? Can you, I suppose you're a bit far away, but can you see the grid scales are kind of they're kind of high here and they're kind of transitioning to low here. So they're kind of crossing the equator with a slope to them. So if you're a wave that only wants to prop propagate zonally, it's virtually impossible, or it is impossible to do. So looking at, if you try and identify uh, where Coriolis is equal to zero, that's it. <laughs> so you're kind of varying between um, one and a half degrees either side of the equator. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So you can basically put this in um, to the shell. So I should say the, the actual, so this is the, um, what the model they use for a paleo runs. So it's kind of thousand year kind of time scale runs. And when they're, it's, so it's three degree grid in the ocean, which is relatively coarse. And when you start moving to um, the, the actual models they're using for the projections, they're one degree grid. And these kind of changes, so we said as a three degree grid, we're moving one and a half degrees either side of the equator to find Coriolis is equal to zero. When you're moving down to a one degree grid, you're only gonna be moving half a degree either side of the equator to get the Coriolis equal to zero. So it's less apparent in their kind of actual full blown model that they're using for the IPCC. But for, in terms of the paleo context, this is what they are using. So plugging, so your shallow water model, we've got a three degree grid. We're kind of manipulating, manipulating our Coriolis force parameter just so it tracks basically what they've done. And we can do, 
this. <coughs> so it's got the same wind stress patch forcing that we used in the previous run. You can see the 3D rear grid, the whole thing's kind of smashed out a bit compared to the movie we watched previously. We can go back to that actually. Okay. <coughs> so it's the same wind stress patch. So you can see here we're between about plus or minus eight degrees is where the signal was kind of totally tapered out to nothing. When we kind of move forward, okay, you can see, basically if I stop it here, there's a really strong asymmetry actually, which I just kind of noticed this morning when I'm putting it together. The southern edge is around five degrees and the northern edge of this thing is around 15 degrees north. And I was kind of curious, it got me thinking this morning, what, what could actually cause that? So apart from you can see this kind of, you know, really strong kind of bumpy structure, meaning the waves moving up and down, north and south. And then it's kind of, basically I think what's happening is you've kind of got these really kind of sharp transitions where you're going from south to north, and then when you're going from north to south, it's kind of a more gradual kind of flow path. So I think what's happening is the flow is actually getting to this northward point and then kind of overshooting before it kind of turns around and comes back because it's such a sharp transition. But I don't, I don't really know. Okay, so if we look, we go to this, and this is plotting um, meridional velocity, and you can clearly see there's meridional velocity where there shouldn't be. I should be able to play a movie of this, and it'll be just zeros. Okay, so it's definitely breaching one of the criteria. Moving on to does it actually matter? Um, so you're not going to, you know, you can't get an analytical solution for this, but obviously the model can um, still derive a solution for it. Does it matter, or what does it matter? So I kind of did. Very similar experiments. So this is three degree shallow water model ocean with a normal grid, three degree shallow water model ocean with a regular grid, same wind stress forcing. Uh, it followed a sinusoidal profile. So the wind stress was oscillating in time and it basically has this time scale of about a month. Um, and the black line is what the, both lines actually are the average anomalies in a box over here in the eastern equatorial Pacific. So it's how much of this signal actually makes it to the equatorial Pacific. The solid black line is for the normal grid, dashed gray is for the irregular grid. So you can see the amplitude of the irregular grid is reduced by about 30%. And you can also see it's shifting in time, you know, it's about two weeks out. And basically the time shift is saying this wave has to travel further than this wave because it's spending so much time going up and down. So it just takes longer to propagate. Um, and the reduction in amplitude is just due to the longer path and the changing in direction. So I think it's just increased dissipation or increased friction um, acting to damp out the wave. So it has the potential to have, you know, when you consider this as one of the prominent mechanisms to generate ENSO variability, it has the potential to have implications for the model um, in terms of how much variability it gets but it's really unclear what impact it has. But it's definitely an interesting thing that you really, I don't know, I, I suppose it highlights that how good it is to have this kind of theoretical understanding of what you're actually plotting or what, what you're going against, or to understand what you're doing, I suppose, which is not me. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna move on to this. Now it's other equatorially wave, other equatorially trapped wave. So that was my eye candy um, and a little bit of thinking, a little bit of a change in pace. And this bit is really tough going, I must say. <laughs> so it's about 10 minutes of tough goingness. And then we'll kind of come through the other side and talk about some more interesting stuff, or at least in my opinion. Okay. So going back to the shallow water model equations, um, as they were presented before, we're basically going to look for zonally propagating solutions of this form. And with a lot of hand waving and magic, I can pretty much plug these, um, these solutions into those equations, and then I can come up with this. That's, <laughs> that's all you need to worry about, okay? <laughs> so, so this is a uh, solution for the equation V, okay? And it's putting it in terms of um, wave number and frequency of, of the waves. And the interesting component about this is this bracketed bit here is a well-known physics problem called the Schrodinger equation. So where, and you have to consider the, the, you have to make the assumption that um, as Y gets big, these solutions are gonna decay away, exponentially away from the equator and they'll be zero when Y is big, okay? And when you have those two, um, that, that assumption with that boundary condition, um, it can be shown that the solutions of that are this. Okay, so these are the exact solutions. Um, so these HN are Hermite polynomials, Y is just the distance away from the equator, R is the equatorial, like the equatorial deformation radius, and this again is saying that it's decaying away from the equator. Okay, so when we move along, so these are the Hermite polynomials here, and basically what it says, it's, um, 
So we talked about you know the EOF decomposition of the vertical like of the vertical density density profile. This is basically what this is representing. It's saying so you can have force your model, you can force the model with any kind of wind stress perturbation you want, any shape, and you can find the solution um, of that perturbation in, um, in there. So it's going to be the linear sum of all of these different terms. So you might have, you know, some of the mode one and some of the mode two and some of the mode three, but whichever, com uh, whatever combination you can come up with, so whatever spatial structure you want, you can come up with as a combination of these modes. Okay, so it's kind of breaking down the problem. Um, into these known solutions. So I suppose the way I view it, so uh, who here has done like an EOF analysis of any field? Like, you know, wind stress or anything, yeah? And basically, if you wanted to know, so we do an EOF of wind stress in, in the Equatorial Pacific, you know, over a 20 year period. And if I wanted to know what happened in January of 2001, I could reconstruct the wind field exactly from January 2001 with, by adding all of the EOFs together, plus the temporal evolution or the January value that corresponds to that EOF. So basically what it's saying is you can just, yeah, what I've said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. You can find the solution to any problem in terms of the linear sum of all of these homo polynomials. Okay, that also comes with the, this dispersion relation, okay, um, which is basically, again, just plotting you know, frequency as opposed to what, along with wave number, against wave number, or the relationship between the two. Okay. So... There's basically three roots for this equation. You've got the inertia of gravity waves, which we're going to discuss all of these different types of waves um, in a little bit of detail coming up next. So we've got the inertia of gravity waves. Um, they've got the eastward propagating, westward propagating. You can see it's just a, a basically a mirror image um, about the x-axis. Um, so these ones here are Rosby waves. Okay, these kind of packet. So we've just basically, yeah, there's three roots or three, three waves for each n, okay, for each n greater than one, actually, greater than or equal to one. And then for the n equals zero, we've got this mixed Rossby gravity wave, which kind of then, when it gets into the eastward side, is basically an inertia gravity wave. Um, and then here you can see the Kelvin wave. You can also derive the Kelvin wave as a solution to this when you make n is equal to minus one. Um, but we're not going to go into that because we've already done it. Okay, so this is some more, some more equation magic is going to happen. If I had to do anything with these equations, I'd probably lose myself for one, and I would never get it anywhere near finished in the time we have available. Actually, what time is available? Okay. Okay. So basically, for a mixed Rossby gravity wave, what we can do, we can say when we set n is equal to zero, you get the dispersion relation or the uh, frequency in terms of the... Uh, k's in terms of wavelength or wave number in this. You can then get that solution and plug it back into your equation for V, okay? And then when you know you have your reduced solution for V, you can then plug that into the equations for U and thermocline depth um, and kind of do some rearranging and then basically identify the spatial structure of this. So what we've done, when you're plugging it back into V, when you plug it back into V, you're identifying the Brunional um, profile of, of this, what, this solution. So basically, plugging it back into V, you're going to know that for your mixed Rossby gravity wave, you've got, it's going to be asymmetric about the equator, and you've got this kind of low pressure south of the equator and a high pressure north of the equator. And that's basically <coughs> what we get from our V equation. Then you can kind of put that in to the U and the eta and get the rest of these fields. So you can see you've got, it's asymmetric about the equator. There's no f zonal flow on the equator. Um, and consistent with like the westward propagation, you've kind of got this low cell, the low pressure cell leads to divergence um, to the west, and the high pressure cell leads to convergence to the east, so it's this kind of convergence and divergence that forces the wave to propagate to the west. Um, yeah. So, uh, I don't know, I, I kind of struggle <laughs> with just basically this, these solutions. They're, they're kind of, some of them are kind of, are something that you don't often see in reality. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so in terms of where, where we are in the phase space, looking at the dispersion diagram, we're talking here about this mixed Rossby gravity wave. Um, so we're talking, it's westward propagating because it's in the top upper left quadrant. The slope of this line gives its, um, its phase, like its group energy propagation. You can see the, the slope of the line at any given point is positive. So we're going to have the energy for this wave is going to propagate eastward while the wave itself is going to propagate westward. So this is going to be a dispersive wave. It's not going to hang around for a great deal of time. 
we, if we went back a page, we had the eastward inertia. So the n is equal to naught solution basically comes down to inertia gravity wave. So it's an eastward inertia gravity wave. Again, it's asymmetric about the equator and it's eastward propagating given by these kind of convergence and divergences and they're going here. So yeah, so the, the, sorry, I should have said the dash contours are kind of low pressure and the solid contours are high pressure and that's basically just the solution. Okay, so the eastward, yeah. Eastward inertia gravity waves, so they propagate eastward because they're in the top upper right quadrant and the slope of them is also positive so that both the energy and the waves are propagating eastward. Okay, if we move on to actual inertia gravity waves, so those kind of three kind of curves at the top, Basically, you can find out, you, you find the solution by saying at high frequencies, this term here is really small, so you can basically just reduce it to zero. And then you can find um, the frequency in terms of the wave number. This is your solution for the frequency in terms of the wave number. Then you have, you know, that V function. It's basically just only a function of K, okay, which is the wave number, which means it can be solved. And then you can plug that into your U and thermocline depth. Um, now, equations again, you know, and voila, and here we come up with these solutions. Okay, so again, you know, so this is the n equals 2 case. It's interesting, so n equals 2 for both cases. So this is the westward inertia gravity wave. This is the eastward inertia gravity wave. Again, you can see there's this asymmetry about the equator and there's no zonal flow on the equator. Um, the flow convergence and divergence is consistent with westward propagation in this panel and eastward propagation in this panel. Um, yeah, there's not, there's not really a great deal much I'm going to say more about this. Um, apart from when you're looking at this, so this is another, these are the n equals 1 inertia gravity waves. And what you'll see here is the solutions are symmetric about the equator. So the main thing is what you're talking about is you've got um, waves of an even order. So when, when n is an even order, they're asymmetric about the equator. Okay, so it means there's no zonal flow on the equator. And when the waves are an uneven order, they are symmetric about the equator. Yeah, which means they also have a strong zonal flow component on the equator. Um, knowing, I think, knowing whether the solution is going to be symmetric and asymmetric is an interesting is an interesting thing because if you know you're forcing your system with a, a, um, a solution that is, oh, sorry, with a perturbation that is symmetric about the equator, you can basically go and re remove or rule out all of these solutions that are asymmetric about the equator and vice versa. So if you're forcing your model with something with a forcing that's asymmetric about the equator, you can go and remove all of these solutions that are symmetric about the equator. And like I said, these things are happening at really high frequencies. And what this means, high frequencies, we're talking, um, well, do we get into this? I didn't actually mention it, I should have mentioned it on this plot. So this T equatorial time, what that refers to, it's the time it takes a wave traveling at the gravity wave speed, so two to three meters per second, to cross a distance or to cover a distance consistent with the equatorial radius of deformation. Okay, so it's kind of roughly two days is what we're talking about. And these inertia gravity waves that we're talking about here, so we're saying at high frequencies, that's when these things are come out, we're talking at times, time scales less than this two days or of the order of that two days or less than that two days. Okay, so really kind of short time scales. Okay, that's what we've done. Yeah. Okay. And then we're going to move on now to equatorial Rosby waves. Okay. And basically we can find out this term here is really small at long at low frequencies. So when the wavelengths are really long, when the time scales are really long, that term's really small. And it means we can simplify um, this dispersion relation down to this, which gives us um, the frequency in terms of the wave number. Okay. Um, which then you can then plug into your solutions and kind of come up with this. Again, like this is pretty dry kind of stuff and I'm sorry but these are the solutions and I don't really know how to make it interesting. So <laughs> I, I, I've battled with it trying to make it interesting but we'll see. Okay, so what, what we need to know, this is the main one you really want to know, so n, n is equal to 1. It's basically um, you've got a Rosby wave pair kind of straddling the equator. It's basically the solution to a westerly wind burst that occurs on the equator that I've shown in that movie. Um, you've got the, this phase speed is given by this. Um, it's equal to, so this is the gravity wave speed or the speed of a, a Kelvin wave divided by 2n plus 1. So, so this is for large, large wavelengths so when they're non-dispersive. So 
the 2M plus 1, so for the first baroclinic mode, you're talking about it's a third of the Kelvin wave speed. For the second baroclinic, oh, sorry, for the second mode, not baroclinic mode, second mode, you're talking it's about one-fifth of the Kelvin wave speed. And for the third mode, these things are propagating about one-seventh of the Kelvin wave speed, so 0.4 metres per second. So an N equals 1 Rosby wave is about 0.9 metres per second, and they're propagating to the west, okay, whereas the equatorial Kelvin wave is propagating to the east. So I think... That's about it. Um, and you can kind of see that, that kind of speed relationship here. You can see, actually, I should zoom in. Yeah. So you can basically see that um, when n is equal to 1, you basically, the values, this is about 1 up here, and this, you're talking it's about the speed for the n is equal to 1 case is about a third that of a Kelvin wave. Uh, for wave, length, wave numbers smaller than 1, um, both in the positive and negative space, they're, they're both all propagating westward. Okay, and the energy, um, so the slope of this line is also westward, so they're non-dispersive for long wavelengths. When you're talking wavelengths, um, uh, so small wavelengths, so wave numbers greater than one, that you can see the slope of this line actually turns positive, which means you end up getting this eastward energy propagation, but the waves are propagating westward, so the waves, kind of, waves disperse quite rapidly, okay, meaning they're not important. Okay, so this is kind of the main bit we need to know. So what do we need to know about equatorially trapped waves? They're basically how the tropical ocean and the atmosphere adjust when it's perturbed by any given perturbation. Waves of an even order are asymmetric about the equator and odd order are asymmetric about the equator. For long periods, so when you're talking about perturbations greater than two days, um, inertia gravity waves are not produced, so we don't need to worry about those as, as a solution. And it leaves Kelvin waves, Rossby waves, and mixed Rossby gravity waves to do the <coughs> adjustment. Okay, um, if the perturbation is quasi-symmetric about the equator, um, the mixed wave, so the Rossby gravity wave and either, even order of Rossby waves are ruled out. So most of the perturbations we are interested in, like the Madden-Julian oscillation or lots of those kind of things like that, are symmetric about the equator. Okay, and they have the, um, the largest response when they are symmetric about the equator. So they, they're the ones that generate like a, a Kelvin wave. Um, so you're kind of ruling out a whole bunch of extra solutions here. The Kelvin wave and short wave, Short wavelength Rosby waves are the only ones that propagate energy towards the east, um, but the waves actually propagate, short wavelength Rosby waves actually propagate to the west, so they're kind of dispersive, so they won't carry the energy very far. Long, wave, long, long wavelength Rosby waves are largely non dispersive, and both the energy um, and the wave crest will propagate to the west, and they travel about a third of the speed westward that Kelvin waves do eastward. Okay. So again, we just go back to this, um, this simple shell and water model solution. So this is basically it's N equals one Rosby wave pair propagating to the west. And I think these waves are definitely very interesting, but one of the most interesting, interesting things I can think about them is their reflection, how they reflect from the, from the boundaries. And basically these things, you know, this wave reflection, the waves themselves and the reflection of these waves is one of the key um, yeah, key players or the key dynamical mechanisms of like El Nino and so events. So we're gonna talk a bit now um, about these reflections, the reflections along the boundaries. So, um, so this, this is just basically a plot of, of Rosby waves, you know, so they're propagating it, there's two different Rosby waves of different signs, sorry, propagating it from roughly 15 north and roughly, uh, I suppose, 35 to 40 north. Okay, the reason I've plotted this is when you're talking about the flow. Um, when you're talking about actually a Kelvin wave, what you need to generate a Kelvin wave is a change in mass on the boundary. So you want to either remove mass from the boundary um, above the thermocline or you want to add mass to the boundary on the thermocline. So you basically can perturb the thermocline depth at that boundary. Okay, and the way you can do that with a Rosby wave, it's basically if you're integrating um, across, meridionally across the wave, what you find is the flow of the wave um, pole, at the poleward edge is in the opposite direction, but it's smaller than the, um, the flow on the equatorial edge. So you've kind of got this, here you've got this strong, let me think about this, a strong flow from west to east. Uh, and then you have at the, at the northern edge, you've got this less strong flow from west to east. So when you're integrating across the width of that wave, you're ending up taking mass away from the boundary. Okay, so it doesn't, the flow here does not totally cancel out the flow here. Okay, so you're ending up adding or taking away mass from the boundary. Okay, and this is the key component, that's the key thing that's needed to generate a coastal Kelvin wave. Basically, um, 
It can be described, so the amount of mass that Rossby wave is carrying from the boundary can be described as a function um, of the distance from the equator. So if you're talking, you know, and basically, so this is the central latitude. So it's the, the latitude of the, the maximum um, perturbation of thermocline depth, okay? So in this case, it would be, you know, kind of roughly 15 to 20 degrees latitude. And what you know is it decreases as one over y squared. So as you're moving further and further away from the equator, the difference between the poleward edge and the equatorward edge of these transports gets smaller and smaller, so you're transferring less and less mass to and from the, that boundary. Okay, so basically what that says is Rossby waves can be important, they can transfer mass and they can generate coastal Kelvin waves, but their ability to generate coastal Kelvin waves decreases as you're moving polewards. Okay, so now we need to work out, um, so we know we've got a Rossby wave, it's impinging on the boundary, it's either taking mass from that boundary or adding mass to that boundary. We need to work out what is the amplitude of the resulting Kelvin wave. So basically this is our solution for the Kelvin wave thermocline depth perturbation here, um, where A is the amplitude and this um, is the, the, the zonal transport that goes along with that Kelvin wave. And basically the HK here is, you know, is the thermocline depth change or the sea surface height change. So basically you want to integrate this um, equation. So we, we know the Kelvin wave decays exponentially away from the equator, so you can do it from the North Pole to the South Pole. You don't, when we were doing this for the Rosby wave, we basically had to identify the latitude where the wave started and stopped, okay, to do this. But for the Kelvin wave, um, we can integrate it the whole way across the basin and we can integrate it with depth as well so we know exactly how much it's going to, uh, how much mass it's going to take. And basically you can present it like this. You can say this thing here in the brackets, okay, is just a fixed constant. It's roughly 2.3 spur drips and A is the amplitude of the wave, okay? So that's the maximum amplitude of the Kelvin wave on the equator. So basically, you're generating a, western, uh, a Kelvin wave at the western boundary. That's a very efficient mechanism to generate an equatorial Kelvin wave. So there's no loss of mass along the western boundary and along the equator. Um, that's kind of what we're assuming, and I think it's relatively true. So we know if you have you know, a Rossby wave going to the western boundary, it's carrying five spare drips of transport. You know, this is about 2.3, so your amplitude number is going to be somewhere of the order of two. So it's a roughly a two metre perturbation of equatorial thermocline depth is what you're going to get. Another way to kind of plug this in, so this is um, zonal mean thermocline depth. I'm oh, sorry, not zonal mean thermocline depth. So this is just the thermocline depth, sorry, at a given longitudinal line kind of near the western boundary, so not far from where the reflection would be taking place. Um, it's an N equals one Rossby wave, okay? So it's a Rossby wave pair kind of straddling the equator. And you can see the maximum amplitude is roughly four degrees south of the equator or four degrees north of the equator, and it's at 20 metres is the perturbation of this surface, internal surface. Okay, this is the zonal currents that go along with that surface. You can see you've kind of got this, the amount of currents that are um, taking mass away from the boundary is much less than the amount of current that's taking mass to the equator. So when you're integrating this, sorry, from you know, the North Pole or whatever to the equator, you're going to end up with this mass transfer. Okay, and then you can work out what the amplitude of that is for an M equals one mode. So with 20 meters, the amplitude of the Kelvin wave you're getting on the equator is roughly 10 meters. Okay, what you can see here um, is the same thing plotted for all the different wave numbers. There's, I suppose, two things to highlight. Um, as the mode numbers increase, the amount of mass you're transferring to the boundary gets less and less, so it has less and less impact on the equatorial region. And the other thing is there are no odd mode numbers plotted here. Okay, can anyone say what, understand why that is? What, what do we know about the odd wave numbers? It's one of the only points I made about, for about four slides. <laughs> the boring bit. They're, they're asymmetric about the equator. So if you've got something happening in one hemisphere, it's gonna be taking mass away from the equator. In the northern hemisphere, you're gonna be adding mass to the equator. So assuming that boundary, uh, the western boundary is at the same latitude, oh sorry, the same longitude, so you're not the, the signals are impacting at the same time, they're going to cancel each other out and there will be no signal on the equator. Okay, so they had no zonal flow, it's consistent with, with what we expected. Okay, so almost, almost done, almost done. Okay, so this is eastern boundary reflection. Um, so I should have pointed out, so this is, you know, from work. If you ever want to read anything about boundary reflections, this paper by Billy Kessler is really good and it was, 
It was one of those ones he set about to prove somebody else wrong, and it turned out to be an exchange of three or four different papers, kind of the corrigentless, so um, they were responding to each other's comments, and it was a very, it was kind of like an argument in science. I think it's the closest you'll ever get. It took, this, took place over a year or two, and it makes for really interesting reading. Okay, and this solution, sorry, where am I? So this is Eastern Boundary Reflection. It's done by Clark. It also is an entire PhD thesis by, I can't remember, somebody more in the 1960s. Anyway, so you get a Kelvin wave impacting on the, um, the eastern boundary. A Kelvin wave impacting the eastern boundary is always going to generate equatorial Kelvin waves that peel off um, to the north and southern, so polewards, basically. So north in the northern hemisphere, south in the southern hemisphere. The thing that's going to vary is those, it will also generate westward propagating waves away from that boundary. And the westward propagating waves, what type of wave they are and whether they even occur is dependent on the frequency of the Kelvin wave. So if you have a really kind of short, sharp burst of a Kelvin wave, okay, you're going to generate these kind of really kind of low frequencies and you're going to generate westward inertia gravity waves that peel away from that boundary. If you, the kind of waves we're looking at or the, the frequencies we're looking at in terms of answer, you think, you know, greater than like, things that are occurring you know, roughly greater than a month, you're going to start peeling off um, westward Rosby waves from that boundary. And there's a, you can see there's a big gap in the frequency space here where you're not peeling off any kind, no westward propagating energy is coming away from that boundary. So these are kind of the most, mostly the frequencies we're talking about. And these numbers above are the wave mode numbers that are excited um, by that, that frequency. Okay, so the ENSO kind of cycle is somewhere in, in kind of this range. Okay, so I suppose... Yeah, you could see you know, we, when I showed that movie earlier, you could see the, the Kelvin waves kind of peeling across the coast and there was also, and then they started to remove themselves from that eastern edge and propagate across the boundary. So that was kind of the westward, um, pro, yeah, westward Rosby wave. Okay. All right. So now we're just going to move a little bit on to and so I'm just trying. I'm going to try and explain how these wave dynamics, how they all come into play, and how they link back together to create ENSO, or at least one of the main mechanisms. So to generate an ENSO event, so what I've got here, this is just the wind stress vectors linearly regressed against Nino 3 SST. The background shading is the wind stress curl. So you can see it's kind of largely symmetric about the equator. Um, this here, don't worry about these kind of big arrows. It's just the, the only plot I could find <laughs> at the time. Okay, so this is um, Nino 3 S SST regressed against the depth of the 20 degree isotherm. Okay, so you can clearly see this kind of Rosby wave pair kind of straddling the equator. Um, there's kind of a Kelvin wave signal and you can kind of see this kind of uh, Rosby wave energy kind of peeling away from the equator in here. And this is the sea surface temperatures that are, yeah, they're not the ones that are linearly related to SST, uh, to Nino 3, but the pattern's virtually the same, just the, the color bar will be a bit different. So let's just say they all are. So all of these things are linearly related to ENSO. And what the Bjorkness feedback says, basically if you have a perturbation in any one of these three fields, it's going to lead to perturbations in the other two of these fields, which will then feed back and amplify that original feedback. So let's consider you know, a change in thermocline depth. Okay, you've got a change in thermocline depth in the eastern Pacific. Okay. It, um, just looking at these grey colours here, so thermocline depth in the eastern Pacific is directly related to the overlying sea surface temperature at, at zero lag. So it's going to lead to a change in the sea surface temperature in the eastern Pacific at zero lag, so virtually instantaneously. So obviously as you're moving away from the equator, as you, as you can see, sorry, moving to the central Pacific, you know, it's starting to lag the thermocline depth by several months. But we don't need to worry about that at the moment. So we've got this change in thermocline depth. It leads to a change in sea surface temperature, which then leads to uh, a change in the overlying winds, okay, because the sea surface temperature gradient across the Pacific has changed. So these winds are then um, kick off an equatorial Kelvin wave, which then feeds back, um, amplifying that original sea surface temperature signal. So you've kind of got yourself stuck in this loop, okay? All you needed was one thing to start get yourself into the loop and then you're in this loop, this positive feedback loop where the event is going to keep growing and growing. So you ask yourself, so what are the triggers? And basically these are the things we're talking about triggers. So these are the, one of the main things that, or oh, the way we understand it at least at the moment, um, is westerly wind bursts are really important, they're really important triggers. They generate these downwelling Kelvin waves which propagate across the Pacific and when they get to the eastern Pacific they um, change the sea surface temperature which starts the whole feedback process. Okay. Um, so I should say, so these are the Kelvin waves that have occurred this year, okay, and this is the current sea surface temperature map as of last week, okay, so you've got these sea surface temperature anomalies 
and the Eastern Pacific responding to these kind of changes in thermocline depth. Okay, and it's less so in the Central Pacific. Okay. So now what we need, so we've got ourselves in this positive feedback loop, we need a negative feedback. And where does the negative feedback come from? Basically it comes from the off so those off equatorial Rossby waves, the N equals one Rossby wave. So we've got this signal, it propagates away from the equator and at the same time you've got the Bjerknes feedback shooting off these Kelvin waves over to the Eastern Pacific to amplify the event. You've got these off equatorial Rossby waves which are gonna slowly propagate to the western boundary. And when they, when they get to the western boundary, they're gonna reflect and generate a Kelvin wave of the opposite sign that comes back, shoots back through and cancels out the El Nino event. Um, so that's basically the, the dynamics of this thing called the, the delay action oscillator. It's a, a fundamental theory, like, or one of the main theories that describes Enzo variability. Um, and that's it for me. So thanks very much for listening. <laughs> What do you think is going to happen for the rest of this year with this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. So the Bureau says there's 70% chance of an El Nino event going to happen. I, I, I'm, I think there will be. The only thing, when you look at kind of this recent sea surface temperature map, it's got these, um, these sea surface temperature anomalies have been in the Western Pacific for a long time and they're kind of still hanging around. And basically, so the stuff, in the, so it's basically we haven't changed the sea surface temperature gradient that much because they're still there. So it, it might not amplify. The Bjerknes feedback hasn't really kicked in at the moment. Um, so it, it really should be starting to do it now, I think. Yeah. You mentioned these uh, different gravity waves and, and stuff like that, but when you're going through the theory, you sort of said that you don't really find these things in observations. Oh, I, well, I don't know. They're, they're, they're operating on really kind of short time scales, the inertia gravity waves. So I don't, know, I, I don't really look. I think, I think they're definitely in the atmosphere. Um, yeah, I, I think people can find them in the ocean, but it's just generally not on the time scales of the observations that we have. So are there any like particle important at all? Or? Uh, yes, <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, in the atmosphere, the climate is important for the dynamics of the stratosphere. So for example, the QBO, the quasi-burning oscillation, this, this oscillation in the stratosphere from east to east to west, yeah but I don't know if it's we don't know it's I don't know <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody out there that does know you know <laughs> Maybe just make a comment um, on, the, on the atmosphere. If you go back a little bit, just to yep. go to the year equals one Rossby wave. <coughs> yep. okay. So, yep. so for the for navigation, not because we've run out of any sort of stuff, maybe that it's, it's, it's reasonably common to see the rock on side one on the other side of the, the equator, and that's. That, and that, and it's thought to be the end one was the wave, so it's the, it's the, the, uh, the vortical pegs on the inside of the, the equator that's responsible for those twin top of the that you see on occasion. It's not that uncommon, actually. Yeah. 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 So I should point out, too, basically the atmospheric response um, to an ENSO sea surface temperature anomaly is a N equals one Rosby wave and a, a Kelvin wave on the equator. So it's basically. Where are we? So it's kind of like. That. <laughs> That's basically the atmospheric response so you've, to, to the heating. You've kind of put this heating up here and you're getting a Kelvin wave propagating across, and that's what generates. So it's exactly the same waves in the atmosphere is responsible for that positive feedback of your Birkenius feedback. So, anyway. I have a question. It's <laughs> one, of, one of the, 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 the really simple, simple features of this theory is that there's no background flow and the background flow doesn't vary um, in the in the east west direction. Yep. That's certainly not true in the atmosphere and, and so, so the waveguide at least in the atmosphere is sort of quite perturbed and it's yep. the regions that converge and diverge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that problem's still a bit I think still yet to be solved problem. Yeah. 
in the ocean? Is this a, is this a, is this a limitation of theory? I th yeah. I think it does a reasonable, there are a lot of things that it doesn't do. When you start getting down to the finer details of a lot of things, the simplifications we have to go through to get here um, are, are problems. So just recently we've been talking, there's a guy that started working, he's talking about tropical instability waves and they kind of have this huge role of modulating the sea surface temperatures in the eastern equatorial Pacific and modulating the upwelling and the uh, horizontal mixing, even the horizontal mixing of temperature in representing it as one layer. Um, so. I think it's a problem, and I think these are huge simplifications, and I think you can only go so far with these simplifications, but they get you a long way towards so the final the solution. Atmosphere. It's not really just, like, it's all about Yeah. In the, in the Pacific Basin, yeah. is it, how uniform is the, the zone one? Uh, yes, oh, the relatively uniform apart from the North Equatorial Countercurrent, which is kind of about five to 10 degrees north. It's kind of a narrow band shooting west. Outside of that, everything else um, between pay plus or minus 30 is going in the same direction, at least, at least at the surface. And the equatorial undercurrent, that's not yes. taken into account. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Can I just, can I yeah. just pick up on, on yeah, something yeah. that- Yeah, uh, yeah, go for it. Most of these matches, actually, which, and, and Shane mentioned it, that, you know, what raises the water is about information around the ocean. Well, another way to look at that, is how the circulation of the ocean is set up in response to the forecast. And uh, um, Shane showed the response to a windburst, kind of in the mid uh, mid latitudes of the of the north. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. something that comes out of this, which which uh, which I think is important, is that if you have something going on in the mid latitudes, forcing the ocean. The route for the, um, uh, sorry, I'll take a step back. If you've got a pond and you throw a pebble in it, then ripples spread out and go back and everything equilibrates again. If you do that in the ocean, uh, you, you have a windburst from, say, 30 degrees north. The information from the gate squares down, it hits the, the coast, turns into Kelvin Way. Uh, it's probably going west of the Rusty Way, sorry. It hits the coast south of the Rusty Way, uh, as a Kelvin Way then get to the equator and it can propagate back across the whole ocean basin. And then it can propagate north again as a Kelvin wave. And then it can propagate back west as a, as a Rusty wave. So the orientation of these waves are really important because they set the structure of how the ocean responds to any change yeah. in the um, and, and you can see it in that diagram there. Yeah. The first half of the so th I think you can analytically solve these equations for, for these kind of modes. So like the modes of importance, you know, so it's taking into account the kind of the boundary reflections and how the whole thing's kind of adjusting, I think. You know, any time yeah. we have to be really brutal about the time. <laughs> we do have to wind this up, just to ask them again here for afternoon tea. Uh, thanks very much for speaking this morning. We have a third, a third.